Um, good welcome to the session on uh, leadership development in scholarly publishing, a practical conversation. Um, I'm going to start by apologizing that I was out at the, at the party last night and apparently talking a lot, and I feel like my voice is dying, so uh, I'll apologize now for the crazy voice cracks that you'll hear. Um, my name is Ben Mudrak. Uh, I work at Research Square. Um, I'm also one of the program committee co-chairs. Um, so in addition to uh, talking with you today about leadership development with these fine folks, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the meeting as well if you want to catch me sometime later. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce a really awesome panel, and um, we, we hope this will be a chance to um, just to have a good discussion. So uh, really looking for, uh, if you've got ideas, you've got questions, you, you want to steer us in a particular direction that's going to be most relevant for why you're here and what you're interested in, please do. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and introduce the, the folks, and um, we'll get started with uh, a few questions that we have, have planned out to try to get the ball rolling, but um, I would love to, to hear from you guys as well. So I have um, with us um, Allison Labatti from Wiley, uh, I've got Julie Nash from j, &J Editorial, uh, Lethia Girding, who's the managing editor of the Journal of Prosthodontics, um, and Rick Anderson, who is the Associate Dean for Collections and Scholarly Communication at the Library of the University of Utah. He's also SSP past president. Or, um, so I'd love to also get to know you guys a little bit. I know it's, it's hard from way up here, but if we could do a quick show of hands, I'm curious sort of a, your backgrounds, your interests, and things like that. Um, how many of you are, are early in your careers in publishing? It's like less than five years you've had in publishing. OK, so pretty good number. <clears throat> how about somewhere between five and 15? So you're, OK, so maybe even least what there. Um, any folks that have more than 15 years of, of experience in the industry? OK, wonderful. All right, well, welcome. So we have a pretty good, pretty good array there. Um, how many of you are, are managers? You have um, staff that report to you. OK. All right, wonderful. Um, how many of you work remotely or have colleagues at your, your office that, that work remotely? OK, me too. Yeah. OK, wonderful. Um, and then I'd love to maybe uh, get a sense of general institution. Um, how many of you are from a library or an academic center? OK. Um, a university press? Wonderful. Uh, a society? Uh, OK, great. Um, a commercial publisher or other publisher that I haven't listed yet? <laughs> awesome, thanks. Um, and what about like an industry service provider, sort of the, that's me too. OK, uh, thanks for coming. Um, and finally, one other question that, that we were curious about. Um, how many of you have a background in like, science or, or research of some sort? OK, great. Um, wonderful. Um, well, as I mentioned, um, I'm just going to kind of get, get started um, and uh, kind of go down the list, let, let them talk a little bit, um, but I'd love to, to hear your thoughts as well. Um, so I was going to start, Mike, I think we can just maybe go down this way if that works. Um, if you would introduce yourself and explain a little bit about your, your current role, your career path, um, and maybe how, how big is your organization that you, that you work in? Sure. Let me check. This is on, yes? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Labati, and I'm currently with John Wiley & Sons, which is a, you probably know, a very large uh, commercial publishing operation. We are over um, 200 years old, so we've got a long history and a large um, organization that has evolved over time. Uh, and I think I represent on this panel the largest company, um, which poses all kinds of opportunities and challenges when we think about leadership and what we can do for ourselves and for our teams um, in developing and growing. Um, I work in Wiley's research division, which is what produces our uh, peer-reviewed research journals, and in the society services part. Um, so we're the group that works with all of our um, society partners to uh, develop and grow their research programs. Um, my own, quickly, my own career path has been mostly in commercial, uh, academic, scholarly publishing. Um, I have moved around a little bit amongst the publishers, having worked for Taylor and Francis, uh, Sage, uh, and Blackwell also. So my experience is mostly in that sector, in that realm, with these 
sizable, mid to large size companies. Um, and I think we've got a lot of good topics to talk about. I personally am really hoping we get some thoughts and ideas and engagement from you too. I don't think we have a microphone for the audience. No, it doesn't so, look like it. So. so we'll just have to ask you to speak up. Oh, do you um, want one? Oh, okay, we do. Sweet. Oh, wonderful. All right. We do have a microphone. So I'll pass it over to Julie. Great. I'm going to shift this here. So I'm Julie Nash, and I'm a senior partner at J&J &J Editorial. And we, I'm representing sort of a small business um, uh, viewpoint. So we employ about 130 people in the Research Triangle Park area of North Carolina. Um, so we started as sort of a small company with just maybe a few handful of people and in the last 10 years we've grown quite substantially but in the compared to Wiley or the University of Utah we're sort of the small small fish in that pond so we do uh, do a lot of things creatively um, to make our budget go a long way to be able to provide as much leadership opportunity and professional development to as many people in our office as we as we can um, so just a little bit about my career path so I actually have a degree in journalism, and I started my career working for newspapers, which I thought I would do for the rest of my life when I was 22 years old. And then I took a, a redirect back in 2000 and started working at a journal um, at Duke University. And it was back in the day when everything was paper. It was very much an, uh, very much an administrative job, not really something that I even at the time saw as what could be a profession. Um, but my business partner and I, I were a bit ambitious so we kind of kept pushing like well can we go to this conference can we do this can we try and take this online and so eventually that journal did go online um, as of course all of them did now and so we were we were part of that process and through that opportunity um, we kind of took more journals and then um, about 10 years ago J and J as it is now was was born so um, so it has been sort of a trial and error process I think for me it wasn't something necessarily that I thought I would be sitting here as a business owner talking about academic publishing, but it's been a really rewarding experience and I've learned a lot along the way. So hopefully I can share some of those things that went well and things that didn't go well that I would advise others to do differently. So I'll turn it over to Alethea. Hello. Um, is this? Yeah. I am Alethea Girding, and if uh, Julie represents a small fish, I, I represent a really small fish. Um, I am um, an employee of the American College of Prosthodontists. We are um, a very small dental specialty organization. I think there are 12 staff members at our whole society, and I'm the only one of them that works on the journal. We're a widely published society journal. Um, um, and I also work remotely. Like Julie, when I took the job, it was very paper-based, and I was co-located with our editor-in-chief at the University of North Carolina. Um, he's since moved on, but I've stayed. I no longer have to be co-located with him. So um, I represent those who both work from home and remotely from both my editor-in-chief and my society, and also for a very small organization. Um, my career path is somewhat less traditional in that I, um, I graduated from the Naval Academy and spent seven years as a Navy officer um, in the late 90s right around the time they first started letting women go on aircraft carriers and things like that so that was me um, and then I went to Washington DC to work at the Office of Naval Intelligence so I am a proud alumna of the deep state um, <laughs> Um, and I got my master's degree in media and public affairs at George Washington. Um, and then my husband and I moved to North Carolina and I thought for sure I'd be able to snap my fingers and get a job with my fantastic resume. Um, the only thing I was offered was to work for the North Carolina State Department of Transportation and go to elementary schools dressed in a big uh, costume that was like a big bug costume and talk about and talk about how it was important to um, keep litter off the roads. Um, but ultimately, <laughs> I, I said no. Did you take that? <laughs> I did not, no. And um, so I got this job. And at the time, it was very administrative and clerical. And I sort of looked at it as a job. And now that was 15 years ago. And I look at it as a career. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm Rick Anderson. Uh, I, I work in the library at the University of Utah. Um, I got my library degree in 1993 at a time when there were almost literally no jobs in libraries. Um, but I was very fortunate to find a gig as a bibliographer at a company that was then called Yankee Book Peddler uh, in New Hampshire. It later was called YBP and then it got ingested by EBSCO and has gradually um, sort of lost its uh, corporate identity. It's, it's now a service called Gobi uh, from EBSCO. Um, but uh, 25 years ago, it was a uh, scrappy up and coming uh, book vendor with a lot of opportunity. I spent uh, a wonderful four years there um, before going to work at uh, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro as uh, the head acquisitions librarian. Um, I went from there to uh, the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, where I was the director of, uh, um, <laughs> and I can't remember what my title was because I'm sitting on a stage. I was director of something or other. Um, I, I was the collection development officer, um, director of resource acquisition. That's what we ended up calling my job. Uh, and then about 11 years ago, I came to the University of Utah as uh, Associate Dean for Collections and Scholarly Communications. So um, I don't work in publishing, except to the degree that librarianship and publishing intersect, which they do a lot more now than they did 11 years ago. Uh, we have um, uh, an author services program in the library. We have uh, a... Um, scholarly communication program in the library, both of which report up to me. So uh, that's been a lot of fun to work with and, and, to, uh, and it's been a lot of fun to develop those programs uh, in, uh, in collaboration with an amazing staff. Um, so the, uh, our organization, uh, the University of Utah has about 32,000 students, about 2,500 faculty. I think that probably includes adjuncts. In the library, we have 45 faculty, 250-ish uh, full-time employees generally. Uh, we're a, a middle-tier ARL library. That's us. Awesome. All right. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so the, the topic of, of our discussion today is, is leadership development. Um, so I do, I do want to just pose a question to, to each of you. Um, what advice do you have for people in the room who are looking for growth opportunities? So what, what can they do to look for, for new ways to develop leadership skills? And maybe could you give an example of a time where, where you get generated a development opportunity for yourself or where you, you know, sort of took some effort and initiative? Um, Julie, you want to start this time? Oh, sure. You want me to start? Sure. Yep. I already had turned it for Allison. So yeah. No, <laughs> I, um, I, th I think that the advice that I give that people um, working for us is to, to get involved in, in some way, shape, or form and advocate for yourself. And by getting involved, it can be something as small as in the office helping organize one of our professional development sessions. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you all of a sudden have to go to every society meeting that's out out there um, so just look for those opportunities I think with a lot of folks in our office that are doing sort of editorial assistant kind of work it can be very repetitive and it can it's hard to see sort of outside what your day-to-day -day is so we do really try to encourage people to look at sort of bigger pictures beyond what the the their day-to-day -day task is and then advocate for yourself so we do regular performance reviews with everybody and part of the question that we ask people is where do they where do they want to be where do they see themselves in five years and help try and map what that might look like and we do an application process for um, different meetings and, and people going to those meetings so we encourage people even if they're new to the company to get you know to apply even if they don't get picked the first year the next year we know that they're interested in making sure that they're advocating for for their interests. Um, and I think part of this question also was to look for something that we have done to be able to um, uh, further ourselves. And I think that Jay and Jay, and, and Jen's here is my business partner as well, so I can't take all credit for this, was all born 
from looking for opportunities. So we weren't necessarily satisfied with just kind of, you know, doing our, you know, stamp, date stamping papers every day in that sort of paper process. So we advocated to our editor in chief could, early on, could we go to CSE? Could we go to SSP? Could we go to the peer review Congress? And sometimes those answers were no, and that was fine, but he knew we were looking beyond what that daily task was. So so we did, we, by kind of advocating, becoming interested, getting our name out there, we were able to sort of build careers for ourselves even before j, &J started. Thank you. Um, so I, like I said, work remotely. I work from home and I have a very small organization and I would say that part of the benefit and also part of the challenges of that is you are out of sight, out of mind. Um, out of sight is great, and it was great for me when my children were babies, and it's good. It's when you have aging parents that need to be taken care of, or if you're training to climb Mount Everest, which I was not, I'm just throwing that out as, a, as an example. <laughs> um, but once, for me specifically, my children started growing up, um, being out of sight, out of mind, got a little bit boring. Um, so one thing I did was uh, put myself not so out of sight anymore. I asked to be involved in all of my society's um, uh, staff meetings. So I call into those every time we have them. And I will admit that every time I do it, I think, why did I think this was a good idea? Oh, there is better things I could be doing with my time. But the truth is, um, being a part of those meetings and no longer being so out of sight and making myself seen by them has led to opportunities for me because we are a small society. Um, and they need people to chip in and help on projects. And they've found several that instead of um, farming out um, they have asked me to do and they have not necessarily been related to the journal itself but they have been related roughly to my field and have given me a real opportunity to try new skills and I'll put a plug in for my favorite which you can find on um, the Apple bookstore uh, free is a book called Women in Prosthodontics. So I spent a year working on this ebook where we tracked down the first woman who had ever passed the boards for our for our field and the first woman who had graduated from a prosthodontics program and we interviewed these women, many of them still in the field, um, about their early um, their early experiences joining the field and we made this ebook with their stories and then we also interviewed women who had just finished residency and so we it was a really fun and exciting project that didn't relate to directly to my journal but it was a project that the society knew that they could give to me because I had put myself out to them by making myself visible. Um, I think the, one of the principles that, that uh, I, I learned at some point during my career that I still think about an awful lot is uh, that if you are willing to do things that other people are not willing to do, you will get opportunities that other people don't get. Um, and, and that applies to things as simple as if you're willing to go to work a half hour earlier, you're going to get parking places that other people don't get when they show up, you know, at 8.30 or 9 in the morning. Um, but in terms of, of career path, uh, if you're willing to look outside what is the obvious channel of your work, you will find opportunities that are not available inside the channel where you're working. So, um, you know, don't assume that just because you're in an editorial office today that you're necessarily going to be working in editorial 20 years from now. Start looking. It, it, if you want to stay in that channel, there's nothing wrong with that decision but recognize that it's going to limit your opportunities for growth. And that may be a perfectly good trade-off. That may be totally fine with you, but be aware of it. Um, when I got to UNC Greensboro, uh, I, shortly after I arrived, after I had accepted the job, um, they said, oh, by the way, and whenever you're in a new job and they say, oh, by the way, that's, <laughs> that's a bad sign. They said, by the way, we need somebody to become our copyright and licensing expert, and we all agree that it should be you. And I said, in my mind, I said, wow, that sounds like the most boring uh, job I could possibly imagine. Um, but because I was on the tenure track and because I was looking for opportunities to grow, I said, yeah, you bet, love to do that. Um, and as it turned out, copyright and license negotiation 
turned out to be incredibly interesting to me. It became the funnest part of my job, which I realize makes me a complete nerd, but <laughs> it, was, it was so much more interesting than I thought it would be. And it ended up changing the trajectory of my career. Um, so I just, I throw that out there for what it's worth. Don't assume that you know everything that you're interested in early in your career. Um, and to the degree that you're willing to uh, do things that other people are not willing to do, you will get opportunities that other people don't get. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, please. There, there are so many ways we could go, but I, I want to build on for a second what Rick was just saying. There is so much guidance and advice out there now about leadership. You know, the, the five things you should do as a leader, the three things that make ineffective leaders. I mean, you'll drown in this research and advice on what leadership is. And I think what impresses me most about um, the more I learn in this industry and the more people I'm exposed to is that there's no one way to be a leader. Um, every leader is not strong in everything. Um, so, for example, I'm a very uncomfortable public speaker. I am shaking up here right now. <laughs> this is not my favorite thing to do. But um, it hasn't, uh, it, it's one way to go when you're looking to make an impact with colleagues or clients. Um, you don't have to be a great public speaker. You don't have to be great at the other things that people tell you you might be doing or you might need to do to become a leader. Uh, I think what's important is that you kind of look for those things where you feel strong. Uh, you look for those things that you're really interested in and capitalize on them. And I think the other thing that our, my co-panelists were making me think was um, that it's not only about um, leading others and teaching people, but certainly about learning too. So every opportunity that you have to find people who know things that you don't know or listen to others and ask questions about things that you're interested in, um, that just broadens the scope and the horizon of what you can do, who you can influence, um, the networks that you build. Um, I think being a teacher and being a, a student are equally important in this, in this paradigm of leadership. All right, thank you, thanks. Um, I, I do wanna also uh, ask at least one more question and then, then we'll, I, we'll open it up to the floor. Um, but I think this will kind of provide a counter, counterbalance to what we just talked about, about creating your own opportunities. What advice do you have for the managers who are in the room that are looking to create or facilitate other growth opportunities for their teams or, or others in their, in their organizations? Um, so yeah, what, what advice would you have for, for them? Um, do you want to start? Or, Let's see. <laughs> um, I think when I think of um, what has been great for me with my managers, because um, I don't manage anyone right now, um, is know the people that work for you and know what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and some of the opportunities I've been given is simply because my executive director um, knows what my strengths are and has farmed projects out to me that are actually ones that I enjoy. Um, I say that having just worked on a project that involved a lot of corporate whining and dining and schmoozing and was not at all in my, um, <laughs> and, and, and so being also able when I came back and I think I did a fine job, I didn't blow any contracts or anything like that, but I said to her, you know, I just, that's not my um, cup of tea. I tried it, yeah. you know, and realized that it's not. And, and so I think just being aware of the things that your people will be good at doing. And also, maybe you're maybe the sort of person who is more willing to step out and try something new versus somebody who really just wants to stay in their lane. And I think that just takes knowing people on an individual level. Thanks. Yeah, Rick, do you want to? Um, one, of, one of the problems that you have as a manager or an administrator is that you, you want to help people grow, but you don't want to put people in positions that they're not suited for. And um, 
a high risk proposition is promoting somebody to management when you're not positive that they're going to be good managers. A low risk proposition is putting together a task force to accomplish a particular mission, giving somebody the opportunity to lead that task force and then let and then seeing for yourself and letting them see the degree to which they naturally fall into that role or the degree to which they're willing to learn the things that they need to do in order to lead effectively. So if you're, my, my risk advice would be if you're looking to uh, find, if you're looking to identify the natural leaders and to cultivate people who may not be natural leaders but who have real potential to lead, um, do it with low risk propositions like putting together projects that people can lead. Um, that, that's one potentially very effective way to do both of those things, both to identify the naturals and to cultivate um, the people with potential. Thanks. Uh, Allison, if there's anything you want to add. Yeah. Um, I, based on the polling Ben did at the beginning, it looked like maybe a number of you are at smaller organizations where perhaps your companies don't offer um, formal programs uh, that could help your teams develop in this way. There are um, a ton of resources out there that individuals can pursue themselves for sure. So, um, subscribe to the Harvard Business Review, which has a lot of that information I was just saying, don't read it all earlier. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff in there too about um, leadership and career development opportunities. Um, I think while well, I would put the onus on the individual who's looking to develop and grow. We have a responsibility, of course, as managers to find opportunities for our teams, um, to take advantage of their talents and their strengths, um, to not put them in situations in which they're going to fail horribly, um, to protect them as we can. And even if I think it's a small company that you work for, there are ways to do that. There are things that you can try out. Um, one example I might offer, despite the fact that I work at a large company, uh, we don't always have the resources that we want to do all the things that we want to do. So um, in collaboration with the editor-in-chief of one of our journals, uh, we decided we needed to create a transfer network. We, had, we were turning away and rejecting so many articles that were of good quality. And we thought, why should these just go out to competitors? Um, why shouldn't we create a home for these within the field and the, you know, the seven or eight journals that we have in this, in this discipline? Um, I didn't have any way to accomplish that, uh, that program and development and workflow that we needed to do for that project. So I built our own. I found some people who I knew would be interested in doing this. Um, who had different areas of strength and could contribute to this project. Um, and they loved it. They just ran with it. Um, and I think they all found it rewarding because they were able to have some individual influence within this larger organization that couldn't say, we'll help you with this. We'll apply the right you know, backgrounds and, and resources to get this done. So it was not only rewarding, I think, from from my perspective, but I think from everybody on that team, uh, they felt really good about creating an opportunity and finding something new and finding a way to do it within this, this big ecosystem. Thanks. Yeah. So I think a lot has already been said, but I think what I would add to it is listen. So not just look at the skills that your staff has, um, but also look at listen to what they say that they want to do. And sometimes, you know, no company has 12 CEOs, so not every goal might be attainable in the short term. But I think listening to where people want to go, because there's many companies that they could leave your your company to go to. But if it's somebody you really want to keep, I think knowing where they want to be and trying to create those baby steps along the way to get them there, I think would be is is very useful. Um, I think a, a number of you mentioned, had raised your hands at your managers. I think the same number seemed
seemed to raise that you work remote. And I think in that sort of managing remote workforce environment, it can be challenging to have those sort of personal connections, personal conversations on a regular basis. But I would recommend going out of your way to try and do that because I think your staff will be more invested the better they get to know you. Um, and if you, they know that you're listening to them and have their you know, um, career best interests at heart, I think that that's um, very valuable as well. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm, I'm reminded as you answered the last two questions that um, I maybe speak a little to my time at, with SSP as something that I, I really see as emblematic of both sides. So something that uh, it started with um, me coming, visiting, getting asked by a, a colleague, do you want to join the committee? And so it was really something that I went to my manager and said, I, I want to do, I want to, go, I want to do this. Um, and after a couple of years of doing that and being asked to be the co-chair, it kind of flipped around and it became something that it wasn't just me sort of pushing and saying, please let me carve out time to do this. They said, well, you know what? You should help us as a company focus on how we need to integrate with industry organizations. So like, okay, let's take this and, and widen it. Like, tell us where else we should be sending people. Find out how else we can get our, our team members involved. So it, it turned into an opportunity that was, that was given to me um, through something that I, I started just because I was interested in it and had a, had a good time. Um, I'm, I want to go ahead and open it up. Um, we have other, other things we can talk about, but um, what's, what's on, on your mind? Is there anything you'd like to talk about? Examples, uh, suggestions, can be anything. Challenges? I'm going to do the teacher thing and leave the awkward silence for just a couple more seconds. <laughs> Recipes you want to share? <laughs> <laughs> anything. <clears throat> we got one. OK. Thanks. We, we do have a mic that is making its way to you. Um, Allison, I think you mentioned the Harvard Business Review. Do all of you have any other favorite go-to resources to learn more about leadership development, management, these kind of topics? I also like to use LinkedIn. I find people post a lot of interesting stuff there um, that can be valuable. What else? I was going to say LinkedIn. I think, too, just through the different societies. Each society has their own website, whether it's SSP, CSE, um, ISMTE. They all have sort of a network built into the, to the websites. And so I think those are good resources for new informa information as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thing that yeah, we've got a couple up here. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I had one. Hi. Oh, that's fine. We can... uh, I was just wondering, what's a piece of leadership advice that, sorry, you got really at any point in your career, but maybe early in your career that you found really valuable? I can think of two that really stand out, and um, one is um, both being leadership advice um, and also follower advice, which was um, never be the lowest person on the totem pole to know a piece of bad news, <laughs> right? <laughs> so never let your boss find out bad news about something from someone else. Mm. Um, like just as a manager, you would want um, your person to come to you with bad news. You don't want to be blindsiding your boss. Um, and along with that is, um, Try to never go to your boss with a problem you don't have a solution for. Um, and uh, s same thing, he or she may not choose your solution as, as the right one, um, but uh, it's always good to offer something. And then finally, I think this is one that everybody has probably heard, which is um, criticize in private and praise in public. Like that, you can never go wrong with that, I don't think. <laughs> Um, I think w one of the most important principles, I, I, I think, f for managers or leaders is that so you, you, you are going to deal with obnoxious people at some point. If you haven't yet, you're, you're going to. You're going to have to either manage obnoxious people or you're going to be managed by an obnoxious person. And there are two wrong ways of responding, well, at least two. Two of the most common wrong ways of responding to obnoxious people is either 
to give in to them because they have a strong personality and that's easier than dealing with the conflict. The, the other wrong way is the mirror image of that and that is to dismiss everything that they say because they're obnoxious. Either one of those approaches shows your weakness as a leader. Um, a strong leader will engage with the obnoxious person, listen carefully to the ideas and the, and the suggestions that are coming from that person, and will be able to evaluate them on the merits rather than either accept them out of weakness or reject them out of weakness. Um, that's not the same thing as, that's obviously not all that's involved in managing an obnoxious person. There's also h helping them learn how to deal with the other people in the office and you know, all that other stuff. But, as a leader, one of the most important things that you do is you process information from the people that you lead. Um, and if you can't evaluate the, the information itself separately from the personality of the person who's giving it to you, you're gonna really hamstring yourself uh, in your role as a leader in the organization. So that, that's a, a relatively narrow piece of advice, but it's one that um, I think uh, it, it becomes relevant repeatedly throughout your career. Okay, do we have um, one up here? And then we can go. Hello. Hi, I'm Cece. I'm uh, full-time telecommuting uh, for a not-for-profit organization. And uh, I've been into scholarly publishing for six years. And uh, I moved from research, so initially it was just overwhelming for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm still involved from a research point of view. I'm the scientific editor for two journals. But having coming to SSP and uh, <clears throat> reading up and just self-educating myself and attending the scholarly publishing events, I'm opening up to the idea of getting more involved. So I guess it's a two-part sort of question, but it's really advice that I'm seeking. So as uh, Alithia mentioned, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So I'm trying ways to get involved with the society and I'm really stepping up my game and it seems to be working. Having said that, I have a 20-month-old, so my <laughs> evenings are totally pictures, committed to. <laughs> I am one of those moms, but I'll spare you. <laughs> so as much as I want to be thinking about my career because, you know, this is the time I need to think about it, and as much as I want to find ways to grow professionally, I'm not committed to um, um, sort of, you know, contribute things at the expense of my time with my family, but I've been t trying to carve out time and I've been super focused and efficient and it does work. Once you're a parent, you become more focused and your performance goes up. So I've been to some of the RTP events. I met Julie and mm -hmm. Ben and it's been wonderful. So I am trying to get involved here, but what is the smart way of doing that? Uh, there are multiple different societies. I don't want to be overwhelmed, but at the same time, there are too many things that excite me. So in your opinion, what would be a smart way to get started without getting overwhelmed, but at the same time maintain a consistent pace to keep growing and hopefully taking on more responsibility? Two minutes. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so yeah, I'll start point. on this question. So I've actually been asked this before, and my answer has changed, I think, the older that I get. <laughs> and I have kids, and I have the whole similar thing. So I think that what I would recommend is carve out the amount of time that you're interested in devoting to this, thinking you can think of it whatever's easiest for you, whether it's per month or per week or per day, the amount of time that you really want to put toward getting involved and then find the right fit to fit into that time. I think that the local groups are a great opportunity. We're lucky in RTP we have an active SSP and ISMTE local group and that is really good because you can go, you can make connections and you can really sort of carve out that time. If you want to take it another step further and get involved in the committee, I think kind of figuring out what you're interested in and then that amount of time that you have to dedicate because you can say yes to many different things and find different avenues and talk to this chair and this chair and be like, yeah, I want to do that and I want to do that. And before you know it, you ha half your job is volunteering. And we have a couple people who have, in our offices, that have sort of jumped into that and they're finding it's really hard once you've dedicated, once you've put yourself out there in so many different avenues to kind of reel that in. So I would recommend going the opposite direction, kind of really focusing on what you want to pursue and then 
I know through SSP and ISMT and a lot of different organizations, they're looking for people to get involved. So I think that finding that place is the easy part. I think the, the part of mapping out what you have to give is probably a little bit more challenging. Yeah, and, and I'll also say, I think one of the things I most appreciate about this job and this career is that it really is okay, if you're okay with it, to have a job for the time that your children are little or, like I said before, you know, you're taking care of aging parents. Um, I find that this job is intellectually stimulating and interesting and it can be a really good nine to five job if that's what you want to make of it. And it's also, there are enough opportunities available that when you're ready to do more than that, they're out there. Um, I know for me, when my children were that age, I, I, I look back and I think maybe I would now, wish I had been more involved. Um, but, but honestly, it worked out okay not to be. I was, it, it was there for me when it was time to get involved. And um, these groups, ISMT, SSP, will be waiting for you as soon as you're, you're ready. Um, and I think better that than to get completely burned out now and then five years from now be like, no, not it. Like, I, I tried that once. It was, it was too much. Whereas five years from now, you'll be in a completely different situation. I couldn't deal with another 20-month-old. <laughs> it's like being on 24-7 suicide watch, right? Like, don't fall off that. Don't eat that. Don't, you know, don't run out into traffic. Good gracious. <laughs> Congratulations. That's hard work. <laughs> I, I do think it's good to specifically ask, I want to reiterate what, what Julie said, how much, what's the time commitment for this? So I, I love to hear people ask me that, if they're saying, on this, or you do that, like what does it actually entail? And, and take that into consideration, because um, it isn't just about your interests, it's about knowing how much you're going to feel overly stretched if you say yes. So definitely do that. Um, we have one here, and then I, you've been waiting in the back, so we'll get you. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right. Um, my name is Mandy Brannon, and I work at Duke University Press. This is like my third career. I've, I've been at the press for a year and a half, but I'm, I'm an older, new person in the field. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, is there a particular class that you've taken that has stretched you in your leadership skills recently? I know in the Triangle area, we have so many resources, whether it's the Center for Creative Leadership or Toastmasters or something through a particular university or organization. Is there something that stretched you, not as a young person in your career, but as a leader where you are now? I've found um, my company has offered to some of us, many of us, um, a dedicated leadership training through uh, research that we actually published from authors in our house. So it's a course guided by professionals. Um, it's called the Leadership Practices Inventory. And it's peer feedback, uh, which can be really tough and really exhilarating. Um, it's anonymous. So something like that, I think, uh, getting feedback from people who you work with and who know you can be extremely valuable as they perceive you as a leader um, and as they perceive areas in which they think maybe you should do more as a leader. Um, I suspect there are courses and opportunities for that that are not very expensive. Um, I've taken a couple of courses outside the house also, um, although I'm not sure they're recent enough to, to be applicable. Um, what do you guys think? Anything <laughs> recent good? So I haven't taken a class per se, so um, you're right, like the, I think in the RTP area there is a lot and I think that we, um, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities that way, but I do look at other things that I do and apply the leadership skills that I learn from those things, whether it's you know, being part of the PTA at my kid's school or volunteering at the art museum, thinking of how different things in those experiences would apply back to my work at J&J &J and try to make those, those parallels. And that's been very helpful to me because I've learned from other people that do completely different things than publishing or peer review management, um, valuable lessons that I think would that apply to, to work. All right. 
Um, we have one uh, question or comment yeah, back here. Very quickly, thank you. Um, my name is Sophie Moe, and I'm with Marianne Liebert Inc. Publishers. Uh, this is my first SSP, so um, thank you so much for your comments and your encouragement to be more involved. My question is specifically not so much about leadership, but about hiring good talent. Um, I'm in a man managerial position, and I'm in charge of hiring a couple new folks to join our editorial team. We are hiring, by the way. So, <laughs> um, With that said, could you please provide some advice, some helpful tips for finding good talent? Um, anything that you can offer that would be helpful in that regard would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Do you have do you have an HR department that can help you? Okay, so um, yeah, it, it's I think it depends on the organization you have and whether they've got resources available to you. So I've been at companies where I've done the recruitment myself, um, and others where this great HR group does the vetting and soliciting and then just passes on to me qualified candidates. Both are good. Um, I. You know, what I've found personally is that, uh, frankly, starting out with an accurate, um, compelling job description is huge. So we used to, at, at my current company at Wiley, we used to use this sort of standardized job description, um, which never changed over time. And I found that the resumes we were getting in response to this were off base. They just weren't, the backgrounds weren't right, the people, their cover letters suggested that they didn't really understand the job. So um, I went rogue. I rewrote it for myself, even though I wasn't supposed to, and started getting much better qualified candidates who wanted what we were, what we were wanting also. Um, so I think starting with a great, accurate job description is key. Um, networking helps too, of course, right? So. Um, this event, the plug you just made right there is going to help you, is my guess. Um, LinkedIn, I think, is also a great way, a great way to find people. Um, there's probably a lot more. Do people in the audience have suggestions, too? Yeah. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I'm going to go and go through hiring at the moment, and it's definitely the same time you try to hire from. Um, And I think depending on what you're hiring for, so at J&J, &J, we actually, I mean, we're lucky because we sit next to UNC, NC State, Duke. We have a good candidate pool, but we tend to hire into sort of entry-level positions and then promote from within. So that has that strategy because we have a lot of really eager, just out of college or, or you know, sort of young to the workforce folks who have applicable skills to what it is we do. Um, so if you're hiring for that sort of entry level, I think 
experience can be good, but sometimes that internal training and really taking somebody who's just going to be an excellent employee and training them into what it is we do, it helps build the profession in bringing in young, um, young professionals into it. Because, I mean, let's face it, most people are not going to school to do this. So, and I think that sometimes you're not going to find really what it is you're looking for for those entry-level positions if you try to push the need for publishing skills heavily. Um, it can, be, maybe, it can be hard also to find um, experience level positions too, right? Mid-career or later career positions. Um, I, you know, I think my own experience also has been to wait, to not rush to fill a position just to get the job filled and get a body in-house because uh, in, in many cases, I think you come to regret that more than, than value what you did. So wait for the right candidate would be my other advice. Yeah. It's the old yeah. saying, marry in haste, repent in leisure. That's <laughs> it. That's it. Yeah. I was just going to add to um, also for those of us that don't have the resources that work for either a smaller professional society, um, what we found is that we've actually started bringing in individuals as interns. And that's actually been the most beneficial for recent positions that I've had to backfill um, because you already know their skill set. <clears throat> I had a former intern that essentially had left us for a while, was had graduated, was doing a year out in the workforce. And when we had an open position, I had contacted him and said, you should consider applying for this. And it's worked out fantastic. They know what to expect of you all in terms of you know um, who you're working for and then vice versa you know we know what to expect of them um, and the skills that they bring to the position so you know it's really been <coughs> beneficial to us as having them as a resource internally as well because interns can do some of the projects that we can't always get to being a smaller organization yeah, great point. Um, I'll, I'll add a couple things that uh, I think are kind of tweaks on what has already been said but I, I had the fortune a couple years ago to, to hire a position um, and ended up working out great. And I think a couple of things that I look back and I feel like were good steps. One was the job description and focusing on like what the person's actually going to do. And so I, for, for a while we were like, what do we call this position? What do we call it? What's the name? What's the name? And I realized like the name doesn't really matter. <laughs> the name doesn't really tell you what what you want to do. And instead of talking about all the skills you need, it was like this is what you're going to do. If you want to come join the company, here's what we're going to ask of you. And, and I think that really helped because the people that that applied and, and had looked at that and said, well, here's why I can do that. There was like an automatic good fit. And the second thing was, um, I, I, I mean, I'm human. I had a vision kind of what kind of person I, I envisioned in this role, right? But I was, I was careful and with, with help um, to think and bring in a couple of people that fit kind of different backgrounds and different directions. And the person we ended up hiring is not what I would have so I, I was thinking, well, someone with a science background would probably be good. We like we work exclusively with researchers, um, but I went a different direction. Do not regret it at all. But by making sure that I didn't let that bias cut cut off a good candidate at an earlier stage, um, ended up working out wonderfully. Okay, we have. Um, I to add yeah. one one little yeah alternative to hiring <clears throat> in house, and I don't want to. Um, say this just to plug J&J uh, &J Editorial, but um, in the exhibit hall here, there are several organizations like Kaufman Wills, Origin, Technica, J&J, &J, that, that actually are companies that um, specialize in offering managing editors and editorial assistants and things like that. And so there, there are a lot of organizations um, that you might reach out to to staff it externally as well. And, and, and like I said, not, not to plug this particular company. There are quite a few of us, and, and we're all here at this. And, and so that's an option as well if, if um, you want to check into that. Do we have, um, do you have a question? And then we've got one over here. So I think, Rick, earlier you were talking about um, don't assume that you, you'll know everything that you're interested in. Um, and I guess my question is, how do you keep figuring out what you're interested in? How do you kind of keep that up over your career? And I speak as someone who started out in a pretty standard journals, publishing an editorial role, um, got really captured by open access, now do kind of open access policy, open access books. It's, that's great and it's really exciting, but I've hopefully got a long career in scholarly publishing ahead of me. I'd like to kind of keep figuring that, that out. So how do you kind of keep that up throughout your career? 
I don't know because I'm not positive that I've done a great job of that. I, I mean, the, the last time I can remember my career taking a significant sort of, my, my career veering significantly off of its obvious path was that experience that I just shared, and that was 20 years ago now. Um, <laughs> now, that being said, uh, You know, one one of the great uh, one of the ways in which I have been very very fortunate over the last uh, ten years or so is I've been I've been permitted and and I don't know what the mix is of opportunities that I've taken and opportunities that other people have given me. Some there's some of both going on there, and I don't you know I don't know. Um, but for instance, right now. I'm, I'm in a position where I've got a boss who has said, um, look, Rick, you're, you're good at speaking, you're good at writing. I want you to do a lot of that because it builds the library's brand and yada, yada, yada. And it's fantastic. I am in my dream job right now. And I'm just hanging on to it for as long as I can because I'm not going to have this boss forever. Eventually she's going to retire and who knows what happens after that. So I look at that, I think, okay, I'm in my dream job. I'm 10 to 12 years away from retirement. To what degree did that happen because I was looking for opportunities to follow my bliss into speaking and writing? And to what degree is that because I've got a great boss who went, you know what? You love to do this. Not everybody in the organization loves to do it. We need people doing it. Please do it and do a lot of it. it, it it's a mix of both. Um, I don't know that I'm continuing to do a great job of looking for different things that I maybe don't know I'm interested in. I, my natural inclination is to find a rut that I like and stay in it. Um, that's not everybody. Some people are like, dang, I've been doing this for three years, I'm bored, I'm ready for something else. Um, I don't know, I feel like I'm just not answering your question at all. <laughs> I'm just babbling. Maybe somebody else has a good answer. So I was just going to offer just one thing that we've done at J&J in sort of our little pond is that we give we have a, a program that was started by one of our employees to do a job shadowing. So we have sort of different, so we do peer review management, but we also do system support, we do production work, and we do copy editing. And so somebody might get hired into editorial, but really they're a great closet copy editor, but they don't really know much about that. So we give people the opportunity to sign up and we have a structured program that allows them to job shadow other jobs within our company. And that's, you know, sort of in our small company environment environment, that's been really, really helpful. And we have had people then probably that we've been able to keep longer than we would have otherwise because they see an avenue for growth just within our company. So that's not necessarily broader scope on how can I grow as a person, but I think within an organization, there are a lot of things that can be set up, and I'm sure other companies do different things like that to allow people the opportunity to learn of things that they might not have realized they were interested in. Yeah, we, we do rotations, we call them, and people can kind of hop across and try something different. And we also have um, communities of practice, and these are typically not management driven, but are driven by people who have a particular interest. Um, and those, those range, it's just people getting together and saying, you know, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, how can we better use technology to make our, our work easier, like just sort of exploring opportunities. Um, we do have one that's about people that are, are curious about management. And so it's, it's not the managers that go to this. They, they come together and they find these articles to read and they discuss it and they're trying to figure out if they want to go on a, a managerial track or if they want to stay on what we internally call a specialist track. Um, but yeah, those have, I've seen those be, work really well as well. Um, you can't always make those on your own though if you don't have that opportunity. But I think I've done even informal things and said, I want to know more about what you do. Can I? <laughs> Can I come to a meeting? Can I come and, and see, you know, tell me what, what is, is you do day to day? Uh, I think most people are pretty open to that. And I think 
coming to a meeting like this or any of the other meetings is always a good place if you go to, for instance, a session on, say, podcasting and go back to your place of work and say, I attended this session on podcasting and then you've maybe picked up cards from people who, who presented and uh, then you're able to sort of say, and I would like to try it. And then next thing you know, you've tried something completely new and I think you, you come back to your office with a little bit of authority, like we learned about this morning, a little bit of authority behind it to say, you know, I attended this session and there's one on AI, I think, here. Like, I had never even considered AI as something as part of, part of our jobs, but I'm sure that's extremely interesting and that there may be somebody going back from that saying this is something we need to explore and the next thing you know you've gone off on that that path and, and, here and, then and I'll just add really quick sorry that it, and please don't tweet that I'm saying this um, <laughs> if you're looking for that kind of flexibility for the flexibility to go off in different directions and try new things you are probably better off working for a publisher than for a library um, libraries are trying to be more like that but we're not um, and the reason we're not is that libraries have never been expected to be that way. It's taking a long time for us to figure out how to be nimble. Libraries were never intended to be nimble. They were always intended to be big and massive and permanent and not to change. That's what they were, libraries were about not changing. Now we're trying to figure out how to change. In the meantime, if you want a lot of flexibility, in libraries we tend to be more concerned about doing things the library way businesses tend to be more about achieving concrete goals. It's going to vary from individual institution to individual institution, but generally speaking, I think that's fair to say. Yeah. I had a question about um, what pitfalls you might suggest to try to keep away from. I know when I first got some leadership opportunities, it was keeping away from buzzwords and emails to senior leadership that would make them worry when I didn't mean to make them worry. <laughs> Are you speaking of pitfalls in just leadership, in the leadership role, or? Yeah, either leadership role, or you're trying to develop into leadership, mm -hmm. or, you know, not to stunt your growth, because if you keep doing the wrong thing, then you stunt your ability to go upward. I think a, one, a, a very big challenge, um, and I wonder if Julie sees this at all at her office, is the challenge from going to being someone's colleague to being their manager. Mm -hmm. um, yes. um, this is, um, my my current uh, the director of communications and marketing who is my immediate supervisor was my, my colleague he was just promoted into the role and it's worked very well we have a very good relationship but that's not always the case and um, I'd be interested to hear if you you all have dealt with that and because that could be a very big pitfall yeah I mean we've seen that so we've seen people grow at different paces that have all started at the same time and so I think that can that can certainly be a pitfall I think another pitfall is sort of per forcing somebody into a position because they've been there a long time they're interested in management but that's not really a good fit for them and then they end up miscast and then that can sort of throw the balance in the company completely off. So I think that that is making sure that you're, you're casting people in places where they can be successful. And for some people, that will end up being leadership management roles. And some people, it just might not be. So then you play to the strengths uh, and find leadership opportunities that better fit that. So I think that's something we've seen and, and you know had some trial and error with of people that were really good at XYZ job and you assume that they could be good managers but that's not necessarily been the case. You mentioned emailing leadership and, and buzzwords and how that can be a problem. Um, I think another one may also be not choosing your battles. So maybe raising up the red flag often can, can do what Rick was describing earlier of making people start tuning you out. So choose your battles wisely. I think also going to leadership with um, possible solutions rather than just presenting the problem also, from what I've seen, tends to make them respond more positively to your contribution. Um, yeah, I think those are the two things I would you're making me think of. I think the flip of that is that there's a pitfall in saying yes too often. So don't say mm -hmm. no too often, but don't, don't just immediately say yes. And I, I've had cases where they've said, oh, this would be great. Can you do this? And, and I, I think about it. And I, I, what I do is come back and say, I don't know if I'm the right person. I think if you paired me with so-and-so, or I think you might actually 
like she might actually be the person you want to do this, and I can help if you need my expertise. But um, not every you don't have to say yes to every opportunity, and, I, and I've found that works, especially if I come back with a solution. So I'm not just like, okay, you're on your own. See, you. thanks. <laughs> but but I have a I have a plan for it, and and I felt much happier knowing that I didn't in that particular project that I wasn't the one that ended up having to do it. It wouldn't have fit my skill set. I think also another pitfall I've seen is leaders coming in to take a position that's already going well. Um, any new leader wants to definitely put their stamp on things, um, but I think not making changes for the sake of making changes, um, and that t tends to start people off on the bad on a bad first impression, even if it's unintentional and even if everything works out for the best. But um, um, when new to a leadership role, take some time to to get a sense of the organization um, before jumping in, making changes just for the sake of putting your stamp on things. Be a little bit humble, I think, is the best way to put that. Awesome. I think we have a couple there. So. Uh, hi, Jason Winkler with Elsevier. So part of what I think makes our industry so interesting but also challenging is that we seem to have a lot of changes in the marketplace. So with that in mind, what would you say are some of the skill sets that future leaders should be honing or thinking about looking toward the future? Being very, very flexible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we've also seen, given all the market conditions and the pressures, a lot of people leaving our industry, too. Um, people looking for jobs in other sectors because they've thought, where the hell is publishing going? Um, there, and my firm belief is that there is so much that we do and so much that we learn in this industry that can be applicable elsewhere. So I think being, being very flexible, being willing to learn um, and try new things, uh, I think all those qualities are going to be critical for our future leadership. So anyone who's early career, um, this may not be where you end up. This may not be your final destination on your career track, and that's, by my lights, perfectly okay. Um, in fact, maybe even better for the world because you're spreading, you're spreading your knowledge elsewhere. Um, but but yeah, flexibility. I was going to say flexibility. <laughs> <laughs> I think just the ability to adapt and not be, this is the way we've always done it. We've always taken this paper and put it in this folder and moved it over here. Like, kind of thinking about what could come next or how that process could be better as opposed to the way it's always been, I think is super important. And I think we'll just continue to be more and more important. And I think <clears throat> being here, being at any of the society meetings and kind of hearing what comes next is helpful to, to to growing in leadership in this industry. Yeah, and I think Julie hit on this a little bit, and I think this is a difficulty with being a leader in this industry, is that what makes you good at being a copy editor or a journal manager or uh, really anything with running the day-to-day -day business of, of scholarly publishing involves like extreme attention to detail and sort of an introvert's personality and just drilling down on what you're doing, which is really the exact opposite of what it means to be a good leader. So having to hone both of those skills, um, and I think Julie mentioned that when she said, you know, just because you're really, really good at your job doesn't necessarily mean you'll be a good leader. Um, being a good leader often means being an extrovert, and I think that this is an industry that draws a lot of introverts. And so um, I, I like to say that I'm, I'm an introvert who can play an extrovert when I need to. And I think that's that's probably a good skill to have. And I would say that same thing is true times ten for libraries. You know, we often bemoan the fact that that you know who do we put in charge of the catalog department? The best cataloger. <laughs> that never works, um, because almost invariably the best cataloger is the person who is best at narrowing in, focusing on the right answer to the question. And anyway. Um, but in response to your question, I, I'm going to get a little more zen, and I'm going to say that uh, I, I think one of the most important characteristics we can have to move forward, uh, and I say this industry in the broadest sense, speaking as a librarian, um, is the ability to distinguish 
between is questions and should questions and act on them accordingly. I, I, when I look around me at the things that I think are the most problematic right now in libraries, in publishing, in scholarly communication generally, so many of those problems arise from either an inability or an unwillingness to see and act on the difference between questions about what is, what is objectively true and how do I wish things were, and the tendency to treat my preferences for how things ought to be as if they were a reflection of how things objectively are. And I, that sounds really vague and abstract, but, um, but honestly, in an organizational situation, I find myself over and over listening to people talk in meetings or watching people deal with the people they supervise or the people who supervise them, and I just find myself thinking, you are conflating is with ought and that is what's getting you in trouble. And it's a very, very hard conversation to have with people. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. All right, thanks. Hi, I'm Randy from AGU, and I have a question. What do you do with a staff person that uh, was a high performer and was elevated to a position only to find out that they weren't quite ready for that elevation. <laughs> Nobody's going to go first. Jen. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I personally haven't encountered that, so we might need to go to the audience to get some input too. Um, I think one thing you could do is offer them additional support to get them up to the level they need to be. So whether that's some internal or external training, um, being very clear with them about where they're not quite yet up to snuff, because you've invested in this person and they've performed well for you. I think you probably generally want to keep them and keep them operating on all cylinders. So um, finding ways to help bolster and support their experience and their skills um, could pay off. If it doesn't, I mean, you might have a tough decision to make there, right? Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think to echo what Allison said, I think that as much mentorship, as much um, help as you can give somebody to help them improve, but otherwise I think, at least from my experience, that's where our tough conversation training kind of kicks in and you end up having to have, it's, it's better in my mind to release somebody from a position that they're not going to succeed in than to keep throwing resource, time, money, effort into trying to get them somewhere that it's never going to be. And I think it's, it's in the best interest of everyone involved, including that person's career. Sometimes that means just finding a better fit for them within your organization, and that's what's often happened with us. But it's never, it's n there's no easy answer to that one. <laughs> and I think one of the things that, that we find really important at J&J &J that we've learned over the years is you know, whatever it is that they're not doing, make sure they know. Mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes we get, we're frustrated with people, <clears throat> but they don't know that we're frustrated with them and they're not they given. They don't know why. Yeah, yeah, and they're not given an opportunity to change. And I think that's something that we have to, it's hard to do, but, but we've worked on that. Um, and, and, and we have other management um, at J&J &J here. It, it, it's hard, but if you're upfront with them, more times than not, if they know, they will try. Mm -hmm. I think when we, f we find it we're not very successful is when we've just kind of bit our tongue a little bit and not said enough about it. So that's one thing I would say as well. Another thing I'd, I'd throw in is that when I'm thinking as an administrator, if I promote somebody to a management position and it turns out that that was a mistake, that is not on them. That is on me. And it's my job now to figure out how we're going to make this work. Now, I'm not, I'm in an organization where it's effectively not impossible, but close to impossible to actually fire somebody. Um, it's less, less impossible, but still fairly difficult to remove somebody from a leadership position. So I, as an administrator, have to be especially careful about the management hires that I make, both both from externally and promoting from within. Um, 
So if, if, I look at, if I look at somebody that I've moved into a management position and now I'm going, oh, crap, that, that was a bad move, um, I, I now have the responsibility to work with them and with their team to help them succeed because, again, this is on me. They didn't know that it was going to be a bad hire. They, they just wanted to move up and good for them. I'm the one who didn't do enough due diligence and went ahead with that hire. So just the, the attitude, I think, in that circumstance, I feel like needs to be that I need to take responsibility for that and, and for the strategies moving forward. How, how long do you all think it takes before you get to that, oh, we've made a mistake moment? Sometimes it's almost immediate. Uh -huh. <laughs> but sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes you, you see dysfunction growing in the unit and you can't tell where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone out in the audience? I know this is a pretty sensitive subject, but anyone that has had um, has anything to offer? Yeah. But, but paying attention to that, because sometimes I think we in leadership, well, this is a really high performer, there's some crap going on in the department, so maybe looking the other way. And, and because of that, I think sometimes it, it takes a while to get to that point where it's like, I gotta do something about that. And in my own shop, and I'm, I'm at Oregon State, um, I think um, it's, it's often that we also think it's just uh, that particular person we're trying to manage and everything, but they're having such a big impact on you and your time and energy, mm -hmm. and that means you're taken away from the rest of your organization, and, um, and if it's a leader, they're also having you know, an impact on, on that unit. So really think about that holistic picture of your resources, and, and from that management perspective, I think you absolutely have to take steps to move them along. So. Those are some thoughts. Um, Jim, we have something over here. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, sorry, me again. I was sitting over there, but I had to. <laughs> the, the plumber's at my house, and my wife doesn't know whether we should pay the extra $300. Um, we're paying the extra $300. Um, the point I wanted to make, you know, about people in the wrong positions, I remember early on when I was starting to manage people, a mistake I made. Um, and I don't think I'll make it again, was we hired for um, pretty much an entry-level position. And we got a lot of people, and, uh, and some of them weren't quite right. And we got one person who seemed really good in terms of the kind of area they had their experience, but they were a little bit further on in their career. And I thought, I'll get this job, but I'll, boy, I'll get some other stuff too. I'll get stuff, and I'm going to bargain. I'm going to get two for one, because they have other stuff. And it was a mistake because we hired that person. We were very clear that it was an entry-level position. It was quite, you know, clerical in many ways and administrative. In a, and they said they're totally fine with that. But very shortly afterwards, I mean, more or less like 24 hours after their um, probationary period was over, um, you know, they became dissatisfied with, you know, and got bored in that role. And that really, for a year, kind of infected the team with this, you know, the people were dissatisfied and there was all the kind of things you get with that. And that was my mistake. And to Rick's point, you know, you got to own your own hiring decisions. And that was my error that I thought I was going to get extra. And I think you should hire for the job you're going to hire uh, for and, and not to try me too clever about it. And I've, I learned the hard way with, the, with that one. Thank, thank you. I had a boss once whose, whose philosophy was hire the people that you want to work with and then build the organization based on the skills that they come in with. That's a great philosophy for getting an organization full of people you love to work with. It tends to also result in a really weird organization. And it, it didn't work out well for him. I, I'm, it, it may work well in other organizations, but I think this goes to your point. Um, you you got to be careful about you got to be careful about at a very basic philosophical level how you're thinking about your your hiring. Um, is there anything else about this or something else? Yeah, we can we can have time for a couple more. <laughs> it's okay, we're doing it because these are these are recorded for posterity. People can come listen to it later. So.
Um, hi, I'm Jessica Lapointe of the American Meteorological Society, and I'm the managing copy editor there, so I have a team of 10 copy editors I manage, and um, I'm sure a lot of you have a similar issue where I have a great staff, but out of those 10 people, there's like two or three super performers, maybe two kind of underperformers, and everyone else is kind of in the middle. How do you balance, I, I mean, I've got these stellar people who are always leaping at the next opportunity and volunteering and taking on extra things, and I don't want to overwhelm them, and yet at the same time, they're often the best people for the job, so how do you how do you balance not overwhelming your superstars and also kind of pulling up those people who are maybe underperforming a little? Thank you. <laughs> Make sure your superstars know that they are free to tell you when they're overwhelmed. the The biggest problem, I think, for somebody, I mean, first of all, they know that they're the that they're the top performers. They may not say that they do, but they know. Um, if, but what they probably don't know is that it's okay to say to you, I can't take on one more thing right now, because they're afraid that if they do say that, it's going to threaten their status in your eyes as the top performers in the unit. So tell them over and over and over and over again that it's okay to say no when, they've, when, when they're at the point where taking on one more thing is, is going to degrade their performance or is going to make their head explode or, or whatever. They won't believe you the first 10 times you say it, but they might believe you the 11th time. And I think as far as raising up sort of underperformers, especially within the same team, use those, the, the top performers in the group to maybe, um, you know, if they're not too overwhelmed, to do sort of professional development kind of uh, team opportunities so that the people who aren't performing maybe as strongly can learn from those that are. So it's not just always a message from the manager that says, you know, you need to improve this performance or, you know, you're not going to succeed here or whatever that message is, you, they can learn from peers and sometimes that message or just learning different ways to communicate the information um, can, can go a long way as well. Yeah, these are the laws of nature, right? I mean, if you have the best performing team in the world, some are naturally going to rise to the top and the bottom. Um, I think this advice is fantastic and I think that uh, one of the tricks as a manager is to find a balance between reward and support. Mm. So how do you reward your star performers? How do you support those who are maybe lagging behind? And maybe how do you just let them lag for a little while? Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about life challenges that might mean that you just need to do your nine to five job, or maybe you don't even do that for a period of time because you've got stuff going on in your personal life. Um, by my lights, that's okay for a period of time. Um, everybody goes through this in their, in their life. But um, finding that balance between um, motivating them, uh, uh, encouraging them, pushing them, it's tricky. I don't think there's any one right answer. And it will partly depend on what your organization can offer you to support them um, and who these are as individuals, too. Right? Some people respond very well to public praise and encouragement. Other people don't want to, you know, don't want to be called out or put into the spotlight. They just want to raise. Yeah. yeah. They might just want to raise. raise. Quietly give them a raise. Yeah. Well, and I, I yeah. think that's sort of key. Like, why are they the underperformers? Is it because they're not motivated? Is it because they're actually not good at this job? Is it because they have a life? I mean, there could be so many reasons why they're underperforming that would then, yeah. like, change how you would. Uh, Help, help their performance. And going back, I think Alethea said earlier on, as a tip of getting to know your employees, so understanding what some of those reasons might be, I think could be, could be valuable to that as well. Our, okay, yeah, go ahead. And then I think that'll be the last one, and we'll do a quick, quick, quick wrap up. Just a, just a quick co comment on your question. I'm George Kendall, Director of Publications and Digital Content at American Society for Anesthesiologists. We're a pretty large association. We have 50,000 members. Um, and large publication portfolio, and I have a pretty big team. One of the things that I try to do, you know, we have a chief structure. So the chiefs, according to some of the staff, sit around in boardroom and <coughs> develop vision for the society, strategic <laughs> plan, you know, things like that. And I'm kind of in the middle. I'm the middle man, and I, I help them to implement the strategic plan. But I try to communicate to the staff what their place is and what their role is in relation to the strategic plan for the organization. And it's helped to motivate some staff, helped to motivate some underperformers. So uh, just a quick example, 
um, we do translations of our podcasts. We, we now do them in Chinese and, and uh, Spanish, and the, the uptake's been great. And one of our strategies is uh, across the organization is international reach, um, trying to grow our international members. And so to tell the team that's responsible for doing yet another podcast, you know, it, can, it can get a little boring, it can get redundant, uh, they can get burned out doing these things. But it's not just doing another podcast, it's really helping the organization with their international reach initiatives with the strategic plan. Yeah. So uh, they're really a part of it and telling the staff that they're part of the overall strategic plan and their role is really important I think is, is critical to developing the team and keeping morale up. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so I was thinking maybe if we want to just wrap up quickly, if you have one final thought, it could be about anything we've said so far or something that we haven't touched on. Um, we could kind of close up that way and then I'm sure that we'd be happy to chat a little bit afterward as well um, if people have further questions. But I'll go Rick, first. do you have a, oh, go ahead. Go no, you first. got one. Go for it. Um, I guess two things that we haven't touched on hugely. Uh, one is to take risks. So we have talked about this a little bit. You might, I'm, I'm not a risk taker myself. Um, it might be uncomfortable for you, but really how many risks can you take in your career, in your job, that are gonna be disastrous? Probably not very many. Um, so think about that when you might hesitate before trying something or proposing something to your boss. Uh, Take a risk. My current boss likes to say, you know, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. And I'll tell you, he has never been wrong in that behavior. So yeah, take risks. Uh, and I think the other thing we have touched on a little bit, but I would emphasize is to look for your opportunities. And if you're not seeing them, make them up. Make them up. I think to add to that, I would say as managers and leaders and organizations, be willing to learn um, from everybody within the organization and not get to a point where you feel like you're just pontificating out so that you're the leader and everyone else is supposed to listen to you. I think always remembering that it's a two-way street, that as a leader, part of that responsibility is to continue to learn and continue to grow as well. So I think look for those opportunities to listen to the folks who are within your organization and not just assume that you're right. And I think from people who are looking to those leaders, find people within your organization that you really trust, respect, and, and look to them, if not formal, in some sort of informal kind of mentorship relationship. Ask you know somebody to go to coffee or ask if you can talk to them about opportunities, whatever is of your interest, somebody who's involved in a society or whatever you want to do, and just kind of make that leap to what to what Allison said as far as taking that risk. Because I think that in most organizations, the person that's being asked to be kind of that mentor is going to be just as flattered as the person who's getting that that feedback. Right, and I think um, along with what Allison said about making your own path, um, I went from an organization, the U.S. Navy, that has a very structured career and leadership path to one that had uh, um, essentially none. Um, and so, so redefining what leadership means, um, if there's not a step stool way to go from here to here, redefine leadership as working on projects. If you're the leader of a project and then you get assigned to a bigger project, um, that, that is a leadership. Um, and, and finding your own path, which I think is, is key. And coming to places like this and making yourself visible to your organization are, are um, really good ways to find those paths. Uh, so I'll say two things also. First of all, plus one to everything that, um, that the other said. Uh, also, if you, want, if you want opportunities to lead in an organization, find out what your organization is trying to do and look for opportunities to help it do that. Um, the other thing is, uh, don't, th this is more of a general philosophy of life. Don't sacrifice the things that matter most for the things that matter least. I'm, I'm haunted by the question that you asked about, about keeping work-life balance. My kids are grown and gone. 
Uh, so in a sense, it's too late for me. But I will tell you that committee work will be there forever. Publishing will be there forever. Your baby will be 20 months old for a very brief period of time. <laughs> um, I can look back and, and feel pretty good about uh, how I balanced work and life when, I, when my kids were small. I also do have some regrets. This is a great, this is a, I, I think this is a great field for um, work-life balance. If you can, yeah. you, you have to do it yourself. Um, but I think because there's, I, I feel like the on-ramp, the, the on-ramps in this field are much smoother than almost any other field I, I'm, I'm familiar with. All right. Thank you all so very much. I really, really appreciate this. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, please hope you'll join us for the, the lunch. I believe it's also on this level. Um, and uh, have a great rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.